Amen and amen. I have been called some names before. I have been called a little bit old school. I'm an old school preacher, somebody said. Well, that's true, because I is one. <laughs> I still believe in thus saith the Lord. I still believe in be holy as I am holy. And I still believe in the sacredness of a holy life before the Lord. I believe he's coming soon. And we need to be ready. Amen? I'm thankful for his word today. I talked to my wife yesterday. She, I said to her, listen, I sometimes just can't help but get emotional when I'm reading the word of God. And I don't know about you, but I think it's a, a sign of a, a dead spirit if you can't read the word of the Lord and want to shout every now and then. For, for he has been so good to us, hasn't he? I want to invite you to stand, if you're able, out of reverence for God's word today. We're in 1 Kings 17, 24. Then we're going to go over to Luke chapter 4. The Bible says, Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know. Someone say that with me. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Over in Luke chapter 4, verses 24 and 26. Truly I tell you, he continued, this is a mirror story. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that, you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Let's pray together. Father, in this moment, we just give you thanks for your goodness and mercy. We are thankful for your word today. Sharper than two, any two-edged sword. Lord, today I pray that you would do some surgery in our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. At the time of the first king's writing, the king in leadership was the seventh king of Israel, a man named Ahab. And King Ahab was a wicked man. Historic literature shows Ahab as an enthusiastic idolater who left no hilltop in the land of Israel without an idol, before he, which he bowed and to which his wife Jezebel, this pagan princess, brought the weight of gold into the city every day as an offering. So defiant was King Ahab in his apostasy that he inscribed on all the doors of the city of Samaria the words, Ahab hath abjured the living God of Israel. Meaning, he had renounced Yahweh as the one true God of Israel. He is referred to by the author of Kings in chapter 16 as being more evil than all the kings before him. And it would be his wife Jezebel, who had enormous influence on Ahab, who would persuade him to abandon Yahweh and establish the religion of Baal in Israel. Now what makes this even sadder to you and I this morning, even more disappointing, is that Ahab was fully aware of his sinful ways. Someone say he knew better. He knew better. And Ahab had a very nonchalant attitude toward his sins and toward the sins of others. In fact, Ahab set up in Israel an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, built in Samaria so that the false god could be worshipped every day. We know that God is a jealous God, and it was Ahab that did more than anybody else up to that point to rise or rouse the anger of the Lord towards the king of Israel. The dominant and most profound sin in Ahab's life is the sin of idolatry. And folks, let me say right here that we need to put God first in every area of our life. He told Moses, you shall have no other gods before me. That is one of the Ten Commandments, not one of the Ten Suggestions. And if you look back over your life, more times than not, the trouble probably began when we put other things before God. If you want to mess it all up, if you want to ruin everything, do it your way and not God's way. Some of us have had to learn the hard way, amen? Me included. To put anything before God Almighty is to find ourselves guilty of idolatry. 
Ahab not only participated in idolatry, but he didn't care if others did as well. And he actually encouraged the worship of false gods. He encouraged people to not serve the one true and living God. Let me remind somebody this morning of the words from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and she shall talk when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. The word of the Lord. Something needs to get inside every believer in this last day that says truth is not relative. It is not subjective. Spiritual truth is not found anywhere in this world. Truth is found only in the word of God. There is only one God, and folks, I know his name. He is the father of creation. He is the son of redemption. And he is the Holy Spirit in the church and in our hearts this morning. And what's even maybe more amazing than that, even more amazing than the fact that I know him, is that he knows me. The song says, I have a maker. And he formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. And can I encourage somebody? He sees each tear that falls. And he hears me when I call. Aren't you thankful for Jesus this morning? It was Isaiah who foretold the coming of our Messiah and our Savior. He wrote, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty about him that would attract us to him. Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, of familiar with all pain. Like one from whose people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Can I be so bold as to put the word my to make it a little bit more personal? Surely he took up my pain and he bore my suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. The punishment that was brought upon us, peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Aren't you thankful for that today? Now listen, your superhero might wear a cape. And your superhero might be able to fly. And your superhero might have super strength. But let me tell you a little bit about my superhero. See, my superhero chose to wear a crown of thorns. My superhero chose to die for the sins of mankind. But my superhero did not stay dead. For three days later, he rose from the grave with all power, majesty, and authority. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, Lazarus from the grave, now lives in the hearts of every spirit-filled believer here this morning. And Jesus is seated now at the right hand of the Father. He is clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, and rolls of thunder. John the Revelator looked into heaven by the Spirit, and he wrote this down. He said, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousand. And they encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice were saying, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth 
and glory and wisdom and strength and honor and praise. All the angels, John said, was standing around the throne, around the elders and around the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to God forever and ever. Amen. I tell you, this is our God. Amen. And God has bestowed upon us his church of the living God. A crown of beauty instead of a crown of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. King Ahab, he was no hero. In fact, in fact, he was more of a coward who had other people do his dirty work for him. He would rather command the troops and armies from behind the lines than to be, than to be in the middle of the battle. But he married a woman who was proved to be the actual power behind the throne. Ahab was no murderer, but he married somebody who was. Anybody named their child Jezebel lately? I don't, I don't see that name coming back anytime soon. But to the Jews, Baal worship was the worst sin against God. Not only did God, or did Jezebel hate God, but she would have many of God's prophets murdered out of spite. And instead of marrying Jezebel and having her obey some of the customs of God, he adopted all of her heathen customs. And then he allowed them into the church. God help us if we start following the world, allowing rituals, false doctrines, and customs from the world into the church. Because the church is not supposed to mirror the culture. We are supposed to mirror a holy God. We are his bride. We are set apart for his holy purposes. We are supposed to be a bright light in a dark world, salt into an unflavored and unseasoned culture. And unfortunately, friends, can I be honest here this morning? So often these days, we see culture influencing the church more than the church influencing the culture. God help us and God forgive us. The Bible says, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer worth anything or good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We are part of a different world. We're part of a heavenly kingdom that's here now and is to come. I pray that our love for others in this community and in this world will be seen far more than it is and that the church will continue to prioritize and focus on the things that actually unite us than those things that would want to divide us. So that others may see our good deeds, our attitudes, our reactions, our social media posts. Oh, I got someone's attention now. So that others may see our good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. We need some boldness in this last day of revival. Well... Old Elijah had had enough. You ever been there before? I've had enough. A couple times I remember my mom looking at me and said, I've had enough with you. And I knew it was, it was go time. <laughs> I was in big trouble. Well, Elijah had seen what King Ahab and Jezebel had been doing, and he's had enough. He couldn't take it anymore. He said, I'm going to stand up if nobody else stands with me. You can bow down to the gods of this world if you want to. You can give in to the pressure of this wicked culture if you want to. But I'm going to stand up and preach. Thus saith the word of the Lord, and you will know that there is a God in Israel. Now the people... The people of that day believed that if they worshipped their false gods, they would be blessed with rain and good crops. But Elijah, who was fed up, can't take any more, he stands up, approaches King Ahab, eyeball to eyeball, and look what he says in verse 1. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor no rain in the next few years except at my word. In other words, Elijah said, I'm shutting the rain off. I'm shutting it down. I'm going to show you 
who the true God is, the one that commands the winds and the rains, the one who tells the sun to shine and tells the moon, now it's your turn to shine by night. Verse 2, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I will have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Verse 5, So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now as God is working things out while prophecy is being fulfilled, Elijah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he's in hiding, and it's there that the Lord is sustaining him. You'll notice that God did not use doves or sparrows to deliver Elijah food. Long before DoorDash was a thing, the Lord is using ravens to drop off some food to Elijah. Ravens, by the way, if you don't know, are known as hunters and scavengers who eat other birds, eggs, and other insects. But somehow it's amazing God is using a scavenger that always takes to now give Elijah what he needs in the morning and in the evening. I tell you, it's a God thing. The Lord sometimes will make a table before us in the presence of our enemies. But Elijah, he's all alone. You know, friends, sometimes when we stand for God's truth and we stand for what is right, sometimes we stand all alone. But here's the great news about this today. Even then, God is providing for us. But soon, this is a great story, things start to change for Elijah. God made it obvious for Elijah that he is to move on. His waiting was over. God's calling him to another place. Somebody needs to hear a good word from the prophet. Notice that when God calls Elijah, Elijah doesn't sit there and debate and talk about all the reasons why he shouldn't go and how he's not equipped or, God, you got the wrong man. The Bible just says, God called, Elijah went. Look at verse 7. The Bible says, Sometime later, the brook he was drinking from dried up because there had been no rain in the land. In other words, that prophecy, I'm shutting the water off for three and a half years, Elijah living through that too. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. Why? I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went, he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, there was that widow, as the Lord said, gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. Verse 12 tells us, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only bread a handful of flour in a jar, and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm going now, she says, to gather a few sticks together. Take it home. Make a meal for myself and for my son that we might eat and die. She's telling the prophet, that's all I got left. I've only got enough for me and my boy. God had sent Elijah into a city full of Baal worship where Jezebel's daddy lives <laughs> because there's no pastor in the area and there's somebody there who needs to know that God loves them and that God sees them. And this lady, by the way, she's not even a Jew. She was a Gentile from a pagan land. And I hope you're paying attention right here. God sent Elijah who just had a meeting with King Ahab a little bit earlier, to travel to a foreign land to minister to a woman from a completely different tribe and culture. Why? Because God's love knows no boundaries and is not confined by prejudices. The woman said, I only have enough oil and flour to sustain me and my boy for just one more day. But watch what Elijah says to her in verse 13. Do, do not be afraid. 
Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, <laughs> this is great. But first, I know you don't have much left. But before you go, would you make me a small loaf of bread from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and for your son? For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up. And the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Verse 15 says, She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah, for the women, and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. You'll notice before the instructions came, Elijah first told her a couple things. Do not be afraid. Sometimes we are worried about the end game when God has everything today under control. If God can supply our needs, give us today my daily bread, don't you think he can take care of tomorrow as well as he can take care of today? God has got everything under control. If he has sustained you once, he can do it again. But here's the problem. For whatever reason, we are very quick to forget what God just did when the next tragedy comes. We are quick to forget the miracle, so we want to see another one. When we trust God for the impossible, and when God delivers, our trust is gone when the next crisis arises. What will it take for us this morning, church, to believe once and for all that God is good all the time? And all the time, God is good. When will our faith move from a faith shaken and shallow to a faith that's deep-rooted and unshakable? I've seen people who can't serve God for a miracle. I've seen, this is sad to say, I'm going to just be honest. I have seen people who were lifetime smokers develop lung cancer, approach the elders of the church, be anointed, pray for God to heal them, and God has healed them miraculously. For only for them to praise the Lord, give their life to him, and then a few months later, start up that terrible habit again. What will it take for us to say, God did it once, he'll do it again? Look what happens in verse 17. Sometime later, that's that son, that little boy, of the woman who owned the house, he became ill. He grew worse and worse. And the Bible says he finally stopped breathing. He was gone. That mother said to Elijah with a heart breaking for her family, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? The Lord just sustained her for three and a half years and more. Elijah said, give me your son. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on the bed. He cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then Elijah stretched himself out over the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. And Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room, present him to the mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know. that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. She saw the miracle once and said, surely there is a God. But when tragedy struck again, that faith that was shallow was gone. What have you done, Elijah? What have you done, God? And God answered the miracle again, did the impossible. Life came from death and she said, now I know. Oh, and now I see. 
Now I believe. Now I'm convinced. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of your Lord is true. Something happened to the faith of that precious mama that when her child was healed, it caused her to believe with certainty that God was real. He's all powerful. He has power even over death. And at first, she took Elijah's word for it, but now she has become a witness to the goodness of God, a God who sought her out when nobody else knew she was even alive, when no one else knew she only had one son, and God saw her and he cared for her needs. Nobody should ever suffer in silence. Nobody knew she was down to her last bit of food, a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour. I'm going to make our last meal and then we're going to die. Nobody knew that, but God did. God saw her in her need and desperation. And what would have happened if Elijah delayed his going? Another nameless and faceless family would be gone. Aren't you glad that nobody is nameless and faceless to our Lord? Elijah was connected to his God, and that connection gave him the boldness to speak the words of the Lord. It gave him the insight to obey God's will. It gave him the compassion to meet the needs of the widow and her son, and it gave him the authority to do the impossible and the supernatural. When we put God first in our lives, we will be led by the Spirit to say what needs to be said, to have compassion, to see people as Jesus sees them, and as we love people as Christ has first loved us. We will hear the statement more and more, now I know. I thought I trusted him then, but now I know Jesus is alive. He speaks of this exact story in Luke chapter 4 that we just read. Let's go back to it. Truly I tell you, Jesus continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Could it be Elijah had the word of the Lord, but his own people rejected him? So God said, I'll send you to somebody that will receive it. Not even of this tribe, not of our own people, but somebody needs to hear you today. Go. I assure you, that you, that there are many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, many widows in Elijah's time. By the way, that refers to Jewish widows. There were many people that, that the a Lord could have met their needs that were desperate like this other widow, but yet they did not receive the blessing. And the Lord shut that water off for three and a half years, severe famine throughout the land. Elijah was not sent to any of those. He was sent to that widow and Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. Elijah thought he was being sent to the masses. God's going to use me in a great and mighty way in front of many people, but God was sending him for one soul. I was told at a young age that little is much when God is in it. No ministry in this church or any church is insignificant, and no person is too high and mighty in the kingdom of God. In fact, the Bible says, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last in the kingdom. Music can come. Somebody out here this morning might say, I've, I've always believed in God, but now I know. I'm here to tell someone this morning that God's mercy reaches even into the rehab centers. God's mercy reaches under the bridge into the bars, into the abortion clinics. His mercy goes into the soup kitchens. His mercy is with the widows. It's with the orphans. It's with the disabled. It's with the depressed. God's mercy is with those with suicidal thoughts. God's mercy extends to everyone who feels unseen and unloved, those who have been abused, those on the margins, those who feel down to the last bit of oil. And the last bit of flour, God's mercy and provenient grace is reaching out to all the places the church has got to reach out to. God's mercy shouts to everybody, I can take the old and I can make it brand new. That's just what the mercy of God can do. The altars are open. I've asked for a closing song. 
If you today feel the Lord nudging you to come and embrace his goodness and mercy this morning, I want to provide an opportunity for you around these altars, the front pews, whatever you want to do. Let's just create a moment for the Lord to work and speak and move. I don't want to leave here the same. I need him. Every hour, I need him. Would you come as Gideon sings?
some service. Thank you for the message of your blood that you shed for us, that you atoned us, and I thank you for taking that sacrifice. We can be rid of our shame, can be rid of our guilt, can be rid of everything that we've done. And Lord, I pray that you come into our hearts, come into our lives, and just change us, Lord. Thank you once again for this service. Thank you for Pastor Marshall and his message. We love you. pray that you just Help us to go ahead and have a great day in your precious, holy name. Amen. Amen. You guys may be dismissed.